The world of dirt track racing is one rich with history, passed down much like folklore or legend. Today we're going to take a look at one of racing's oddities. How late models went from stock car to insane, and then back to weird. In the early days of dirt track racing, things were simple. Buy a car, remove some stuff, and show up at the track. This is how a little sport called NASCAR and the more humble dirt stock car began. In 1948, a group of people in Daytona Beach decided to create a new series. Instead of racing older cars modified for racing, they would race newly released or late model stock cars. Although this new series would gain massive popularity, the modern late models we know today would start a little bit later. More on that in a second. In 1967, NASCAR, and conversely, the late model stock car world, installed roll cages in their cars. This would presumably stop injury. By mid-1970, racers started realizing, oh my gosh, we are spending a lot of money on new cars every year. Why don't we go buy junkyard bodies or fiberglass ones and put them on top of our roll cages and chassis that we already have? Well, it turns out that race car drivers like saving money almost as much as they like spending it. And thus, the late models we know today were born. But Joe, I hear you say, these cars still look like stock cars. They don't look anything like what we have today. Well, hold your horses, because we've got some insanity to go through before we get there. The date is now 1979. Legendary promoters such as Earl Baltus have developed huge money races for these dirt late models. Simultaneously, dirt racers are realizing downforce exists. Spoilers started appearing on dirt late models. It turns out the speed and low grip of the dirt racing surface meant that bigger was better. In fact, much bigger was much better. And people began measuring spoilers in feet instead of inches. This is the perfect example of the trickle-down effect from the engineering and aerodynamics done at Formula One, IndyCar, and sports car racing. Around this time, the promoters of pavement racetracks saw trouble ahead. They decided to make new rules for pavement late model racing. Until this point, dirt late model racers could take their dirt car from a Saturday night and race it on the local paved track on Sunday. These rules, along with technical disparity, put a stop to that. The year is now 1980. Do your best to keep up, because things are going to start moving a lot faster. The early 1980s introduced the most rapid development dirt late models had ever seen. As spoilers got bigger and bigger, sideboards were also introduced. These took the same sort of forces created by the spoiler and put them on the left side as well. And as was true with the spoiler, bigger meant better. As this development continued in 1981, a new outside factor would come into play in 1982. The price of aluminum dropped rapidly. So while 1981 had many late models that had fiberglass or steel Camaro bodies and huge spoilers, 1982 and 1983 saw teams building their own bodies out of aluminum. At first this was a huge savings for dirt racers, as buying lightweight aluminum sheets was far cheaper than fiberglass or steel Camaro bodies. Now that teams were designing their own bodies, their imaginations ran wild. Lap time started decreasing rapidly, and cars with big motors started turning blazing fast times. As every team thrashed to catch up, the cars started looking like blocks of cheese, with more and more extreme bodywork every time they showed up to the track. The cars were becoming so big that they couldn't be transported to the track in a trailer. They would need to be on an open flatbed. On top of this, the price of aluminum once again started to rise, and this type of racing heavily favored big motors, and therefore, big budgets. Although on dirt, late models weren't necessarily as popular as sprint cars, they were drawing the intrigue of the American dirt racing world. Some local uh, uh, late model stock car equipment that we're going to see running here in a heat race as the sprinters get ready for some more of their action. And earlier, Steve Evans went down to the pits to try to figure out what these things were really all about. As a special treat today, we're going to show you some of the action of the local cars around here that they call late model stocks. Late model what? I'm not sure. And stock, they certainly are not. Over the years, they have evolved from street cars into basically sprint cars with a body on them. 
If you're familiar at all with drag racing, these are kind of the funny cars of the oval track race. I mean, they are really strange looking. Look like they ought to fly instead of drive. Watch them. I think you're going to like them. By the end of 1983, the dirt late model had changed so rapidly, the cars looked almost nothing like they did just four years earlier. This brings us to 1984. The cars were now complete wedge shapes, and some were asking, had we gone too far? Since these bulky cars were chewing through aluminum, tires, and motors, the backbone of the sport, the small teams, couldn't keep up. So they started backing out. The Dirt Late Model was almost a victim of its own ingenuity. Robert Smalley with the NDRA, that's National Dirt Racing Association, created a rules package to curb the growing bodies. At around the same time, Bob Memmer started the UMP, or United Midwest Promoters, and met with many manufacturers and track promoters to create a similar rules package. With a limit to the size of the spoiler, and absolutely no wedge shape to the bodywork allowed, and also no sideboards allowed, the modern dirt late model was born. Many tracks, with some exceptions, switched to this new rules package. And from what I can tell, it seemed like a hit. In 1986, just two short years later, over 200 cars entered the biggest dirt late model race of the year, the World 100. Although these rules laid the groundwork for late models even today, there are still a few major changes between 1985 and now. In the early 2000s, some racers found success with a new type of suspension, which laid the foundation of the cars we drive today. The cars looked primarily the same, but the left side of the suspension hiked the car into the air. Without getting too technical, this took advantage of the four-link suspension and created a thing called anti-squat, which basically lifts the car on throttle. These cars were radical in their design, and difficult to drive as they would lift the left front tire up off the ground, and it was hard to see the racetrack. Although these original cars were pretty crude, racers proved once again, if you give them a box to fit inside the rules, they'll just tilt the whole damn box if it gives them an advantage. You see, tipping the car up on end like this created a bit of a wedge shape. Although the car wasn't actually shaped like a wedge, the fact that it was tipped over to the side meant the air saw it like it was a wedge. Between the late 2000s and now, we've slowly been developing this idea. The cars have gotten more and more asymmetrical. You might ask, why jack the left side of the car up and not the right side too? Well, this asymmetry shifted the aerodynamic balance of the car to the left. And remember, since we're only turning left, more left is more good. As rules have developed around the height of the left rear of the car, crafty teams have raised the right front to push the left rear down when the car's sitting at ride height. It's important to note that the nature of the anti-squat and the light springs they're using to achieve this are actually still compressing and sealing the front of the car off as soon as they start moving. The most recent rule enacted by the World of Outlaws to prevent cars from jacking way up into the sky is the droop rule, which is an attempt to limit the travel of the left rear corner of the car. So what would have happened if the magical days of insanity from 1983 continued on? What would the cars look like? Fortunately, we don't actually have to ask this question. They'd look something like this. Although these cars are fascinating to look at, and they're undoubtedly fast, I personally believe that cars with 12 foot tall boards strapped to them wouldn't have taken off quite as fast as the Dirt Late model has. If you like this video, I would recommend checking out the rest of my channel as I chronicle my life as a Dirt Late model driver. From the Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania, this is Joe Lusk in the Aussie Race Park Schwartz chassis with a JSR 340 cubic inch chef. Lusk goes second quick.